Right, well, from now on, as I promised you, introductions are going to be absolutely minimal. So, after Tuesday's wonderful exploration of the strange business of writing lyric, and perhaps of writing any composed text at all, Today, the lecture will focus on one element of that fascinating argument. Um, the lecture is called The Impersonal Personal. So please give another warm welcome to Denise Riley. Thank you so very much to everyone for coming back or for showing up for the first time. Um, so, what I'll do this week is return to my query from last week, which stemmed from the current weight given to the person of the poet. And one of my questions is, how else, how differently, might someone's writerly presence be considered, if at all, in her work? So. From now on, I'll be touching on some earlier critical writings proposing the separability of the poem from the poet. But I'll only glance lightly over these. Again, my suggestions are likely to be of interest only to quite a few hearers, and they would be rather boring to those who are confidently assertive. And yet maybe, as I said last week, they might come as a solace for those disheartened by today's heavy emphasis on the, on the poet figure who is constantly high vis. Their weariness may also be cheered by Friedrich Schlegel's aphorism from about 1797. Schlegel said, the worst part of it seems to me to be the complete absence of indispensable irony, and the best, the confident assumption that poetry is of infinite value, as though that were a matter of fact. First, though, a bit more about what I was describing as the possible personal drawbacks of exposure. Now, any writer designated as, quote, emerging, unquote, has to shoulder her way through publicity's echo chambers of applause. But what gets secluded in this world of glittering noise? Why should this matter? I think it's because to be constantly seen or to be heard compulsively singing your merits could leach that crucial space to listen that poetry demands above all else. Wouldn't any open-eared listening to language also entail a receptivity helped by keeping relatively invisible? A bit maybe like that silence, exile, and cunning contemplated by James Joyce's character, Stephen Deedless. The passage is well known. I will try to express myself in some mode of life or art as freely as I can and as wholly as I can, using for my defense the only arms I allow myself to use, silence, exile, and cunning. If that alluring quotation might still feel too dramatically charged to suit lyric writing, it does serve to advocate for the poet's possibility of retreat from a barrage of exposure. Not that such withdrawal need impel her, to her literary death. Only that, rather than depending on the validation, quote unquote, of publicly measured success, it might be 
her lifesaver to be surreptitious, to slither by under the radar. The obstacle is that poetry and the writing person get so tightly knotted together that the author's assigned USP, her unique selling point, quote unquote, will often determine how her work's read and critically received. So against this, I've already speculated that creativity is far better conceived as a potential of language rather than as a characteristic of persons. Yet, of course, persons as authors need to be named for their books to be reviewed and sold. That's indisputable. How, though, do these worldly practicalities sit with a lyric poet's nagging awareness that, while she may, glad, she may be glad and grateful that her work, especially if it's the work of one of an underrepresented class or group, is being made visible. Nonetheless, her creativity is still, for her, suspect as a personal ascription, making her edgy in her mantle of author, while being constantly evaluated and scrutinized might also inflame any half-concealed need in her to be personally liked. It is a danger of being liked. Whereas not being at the mercy of others' applause or their disdain, on the other hand, runs close to the stoic idea of self-reliance. In this vein, John Stuart Mill declared, the persons and the nations who commonly excel in poetry are those whose character and tastes render them least dependent for their happiness upon the applause or sympathy or concurrence of the world in general. Likewise, W.S. Graham's poem, Johann Joachim Quantz's Five Lessons, concludes with this affectionately stern farewell from the composer flautist to his pupil. He says, I will miss you. Do not expect applause. But rather than further lament the relentless machineries of personal promotion or advocate indifference to the swift buffetings of poetic fashion in favor of stoical ataraxia, today I'll be mulling over what benefit could accrue to lyric poetry itself by means of an authorial near concealment on the part of those whose temperaments incline them anyway in that direction. But then why is it even worth attending to the disposition of its authors? My wager here is that for quite a few writers of lyric, unease must be a familiar sensation. Not, though, because of their supposedly reclusive natures, but because any acclaimed, quote, mastery of the craft, unquote, may well ring hollow to them for sound factual reasons, quite apart from any questions of authorial psychology. In recent years, I found myself puzzling along these lines, so if you'll, for, if you'll forgive me, for repeating myself, I'll revisit my thoughts about why some restiveness is reasoned and doesn't spring only from the poet's shyness, let alone her neurosis. Because you are, not fancifully, but actually, speaking into an in-between area where it's not you who's solely in charge of the speaking and where you can't know who is receiving it, your personal authorship is truly not pertinent. In how it's transmitted and how it's received, there's something incalculable and properly anonymous about writing. And this is nothing to do with my biography and my private attitudes. A feeling of shame does appear, or may appear, in the writer, 
when this is not understood, but where the biographical demand intervenes and intrudes, then you are being asked, in effect, to, to subscribe to a great misapprehension about your own work as a writer. Your writing, like your very existence, is an accident, if a different kind of accident. You're being, credit, you're being given credit for something which is not in essence of your own making. It's a bit like being warmly congratulated on how very likable your children are, as if this were all your own doing. Whereas the fact you experience as a writer is this. It's the voice of language itself which is trying to speak. To state this isn't some aesthetic or philosophical mystification, but is, I think, the felt practice of lyric writing in particular. So a large part of your unease stems from being regarded as the sole source of the writing, as its origin, whereas you know very well that you are not that unique source. The language is, with its cadences, its prosody. What knows is the language itself. So to compose lyric writing is actually a working matter of letting it know, in the sense of giving it its own head, rather than trying to subsume it as some already achieved authorial knowledge. That remark could sound like a kind of language mysticism. Yet I still want to contend that it's solidly historical, for the history of lyric is naturally deeply worked into present-day lyric. The lyric is freed from you as its author. Those elements of confession or autobiography have been scoured and purified. I don't mean that the writer's presence is a contamination. Just that, to let language get close to its truer point of becoming a pure speaking out, all the accidents of your authorship need to fall away. And then this speaking out of language itself might emerge from what's been burnt away from the inessential and the contingent. This fire in question certainly isn't anything to do with a martyrdom or any trial of the writer, but it's the free burning of language itself. Yet, if we chase after this somewhat rhetorical strain of thought, aren't we on the verge of wanting the poem without the poet? A large part of me wants to say yes, and that would be perfectly defensible. However, my speculation now is more low-key. It's about what's redundant, even destructive, in emphasizing the author person. Or it's corollary. What's desirable for the lyric in not noticing yourself? Could it assist poetic immediacy and transparency, as in the naive, quote-unquote, poetry that Friedrich Schiller loved. I'll come back to him soon. Though, is it even plausible to absent the self? Since in writing, there's also a perpetual and inescapable self-overhearing. It sustains our everyday existence in inner speech as well as in uttered language. As Merleau-Ponty reflected, quote, the speaking-listening duality remains at the heart of the eye. Its negativity is only the hollow between speaking and hearing, the point where their equivalence is formed, unquote. And this fundamental oral, A-U-R-A-L, this fundamental oral self-awareness is intensified by the poem's own systematic self-listening within its lyric eye. It's, at, it's on this point that the writer's display 
or otherwise of her own authorial presence inside her work becomes of pressing interest to that cluster of late 18th and early 19th century German romantics who shared the idealist philosopher's concerns about the nature of self-reference in writing. Given the many layers of self-presence, they wondered, should it be conceived as a sophistication too far for the good of the poem? And how could self-reflection, which is even unwillingly a kind of self-presentation, live inside the poem without having palpable designs on its readers. On which Friedrich Schiller's essay on naive and sentimental poetry appeared in episodes between 1795 and 1800. I suspect that many of you know this text far better than I do. But among Schiller's desired naive poets, are Shakespeare, Goethe, Homer, and most of the Greeks. Among his sentimentalists are Rousseau and, of course, many of Schiller's own contemporaries. But by the word sentimental, he didn't mean what we might mean now. He didn't mean a shallow and clawing emotionality, but something which is more like Mm, excessively self-contemplating. As the philosopher Schelling would also note, the character of the whole modern era is idealistic. Its dominant spirit, the return to inwardness. At stake was how such modern inwardness exhibit itself on the page. Schiller's distinction between his two categories of writers turns on the sentimentalist's urge to annotate and announce emotions, however perturbed or however elaborated, in contrast to the naive's transparent purity. Schiller remarks, they are, they the naive, they are what we were. They are what we ought to become once more. Of the Greeks, exemplars of the naive, he writes, they felt naturally, we feel the natural. And just in that phrase, we feel the natural, he's pointing up the distance between the conscious sentiment of the writers registering him or herself as now I am feeling the natural. And that one sentence, I think, is a lovely distillation of Schiller's observation that given the sensibility of their times, many of his poet contemporaries were unhappily or happily driven to become connoisseurs of and commentators on a worked up realm of feeling. Its separateness risked a showy collage of feelings with ideas. A sentimental intellectualism, not for him, that true reason which would simultaneously move the heart. Freer by far are those naive poets, Schiller opines, who act as what he calls border disturbers of those, quote, constables of taste, the literary critics. If, quote, sentimental poetry is the offspring of abstractedness and silence, unquote, in contrast, Quote, the naive is a child of life and also leads back to life. He sums up, the poet, I said, is either nature or he will seek it. The former produces the, na the, sorry, the, former produces the naive, the latter, the sentimental 
Even if Schiller's beautiful harmony between feeling and thinking, as he put it, couldn't always be reached by the naive poet leaning towards sheer receptivity, still he kept that power of simplicity on his side. But inevitably, simplicity and an idealised femininity made all too easy bedfellows. Schiller's description of the naive's weakness rapidly grows gendered, emblematic of a familiar strain in early 19th century romantic sensibility. Quote, we see then in nature devoid of reason only a fortunate sister who remained behind in the maternal home, out of which we stormed in the high spirits of our freedom into foreign parts. With painful desire, we long to return thence. End of quote. Whereas the sentimental poet for Schiller, differently cursed by melancholy, is owned by his, quote, restless and oscillating mind. He'll fashion a poetry, elegiac or even satirical, out of his scrupulously self-annotated feelings. He, quote, reflects on the impression which the objects make on him, and only on this reflection is the emotion grounded in which he himself is moved and moves us, end of quote. Yet Schiller, well aware that his device was only schematic, doesn't fix his contrasting pair of the naive and sentimental in eternal opposition. He acknowledges their blending in practice, inevitably so. The younger philosopher, Friedrich Schelling was also gripped by such reflections, synthesizing them in his lectures on the philosophy of art, which were given in around 1802 to 1803, but didn't appear in book form until quite a lot later. They perfectly fitted his own passion for reconciling divisions by refiguring and then transcending them. Quote, this is Schelling's quote from Schelling. One can summarize the entire difference between the naive and the sentimental poet by stating that in the former, only the object holds sway. In the latter, the subject steps forward as subject. The former, that is the naive poet, the former appears unconscious concerning his object. The latter, the sentimental poet, constantly accompanies his object with his own consciousness and makes us aware of this consciousness. The former is cold and without feeling regarding his object just as is nature. The latter presents his feeling to us so that we may participate in it as well. The former, the naive poet, the former displays no intimacy with us. Only the object is related to us. The poet himself flees us. Indeed, that which is actually the ultimate strength of all poesy, says Schelling, namely that the poet allows the object itself to hold sway, rouses modern sensibility to indignation. If his contemporaries, prone to weak emotionality in his view, were apt to swoon into schwemerei, the naive's virtues were, Schelling continued, simplicity and ease of treatment. Quote, just as the beautiful is sublime to the extent that only the absolutely necessary is required for its portrayal, there's no greater sign of genius than that it brings the object into full view with only a few strict and necessary strokes. Example, Dante. There is no choice for genius since it both knows and desires only what is necessary. The sentimental poet is in a totally different situation. He reflects 
and he touches emotionally and is emotionally touched himself only to the extent that he reflects. Eventually, succeeding critical thought moves away from the poet figure as a strongly embedded bearer of such oppositions. And more weight is given to a shift in sensibility, which is now taken to flood through the poetry as well as its writer. In brief, what's exposed, what's more and more exposed is this, the poem itself exudes its temperament. A much later essay, returning again to play off this familiar trope of the pair of opposed tropes, replaced the naive and sentimental with the couple of the unselfconscious and the unknowing. And that is John Stuart Mill's 1833, What is Poetry? And this essay attracted much debate about its allegiances, but I'll only dwell on its commitment to an ideal of a poetic not knowing. To be indeterminate, of course, is not to be undetermined, undetermined. As Kant declared, the beautiful should be purposive without a purpose. Mill distinguishes between poetry and eloquence, and he does so as persuasively as you might imagine. He claims that, quote, poetry and eloquence are both alike the expression or uttering forth of feeling, but eloquence is heard, poetry is overheard. Eloquence supposes an audience. The peculiarities of poetry appears to us, to Mill, to lie in the poet's utter unconsciousness of a listener, poetry's feeling confessing itself to itself in moments of solitude. Eloquence is feeling pouring itself forth to other minds, courting their sympathy, or endeavouring to influence their belief, or move them to passion or to action. End of quote. So for Mill, eloquence fashions itself to be listened to. It needs to know that it's being heard. Poetry, though, must not know at the point of its inception. It mustn't be composed with its ear cocked towards a potential audience. Quote, all poetry is of the nature of soliloquy. It may be said that poetry, which is printed on hot-pressed paper and sold at a bookseller's shop, is a soliloquy in full dress and upon the stage. But there's nothing absurd in the idea of such a mode of soliloquizing. What we've said to ourselves, we may tell to others afterwards what we have said or done in solitude. We may voluntarily, voluntarily reproduce when we know that other eyes are upon us. But no trace of consciousness that any eyes are upon us must be visible in the work itself. But when he, and here Mill means the poet, but when he turns around and addresses himself to another person, when the act of utterance is not itself the end, but a means to an end, viz by the feelings he himself expresses, to work upon the feelings or upon the belief or the will of another, when the expression of his emotions or of his thoughts tinged by his emotions is tinged also by that purpose, by that desire of making an impression upon another mind, then it ceases to be poetry and it becomes eloquence. Well, when Mill advocates, quote, the poet's utter unconsciousness of a listener, this might strike today's readers as at best quaint or at worst willfully unrealistic. For what writing can't sense that it's a preparation for being heard, then too, doesn't the writing self 
listen to and comment on itself to the poem's benefit. Yet, if Millie's evoking composition in some fervently absorbed innocence, he's also perfectly aware of the strong element of the as if in that blessed solitude. He acknowledges that you're conscious of the possibility of eventually coming to be heard. So his is a two-stage model. You write as if you'd be unread, although later you might show your work or indeed get presented yourself. But the point is that to calculate your audience in the act of composing would damage the truthfulness of your writing. Or, in just one of several 20th century reiterations of this position, quote, when the workman is dead, the only thing that will matter is the work objectively considered. Moreover, the workman must be dead to himself while engaged upon the work. Otherwise, we have that sort of self-expression which, which is as undesirable in the painter or the writer as in the carpenter, the cantor, the halfback, or the cook. And as you might recognize, the author here is... Um, that terrific writer David Jones in his Anathemata. And while, quote, self-expression, unquote, is now rather an easy dead horse to flog, Jones's commendation of the workman who's temporarily dead to himself accords well enough, I think, with John Stuart Mill's stance. Nevertheless, it's still true that, as any contemporary lyric writer may sense, removing the self from the work can coincide with, quote, expressing, unquote, that self. And here, the critic and historian Claire Wills has observed how a dance beautifully conceived, sorry, a dance beautifully executed leaves a great purity of emptiness in its wake. She comments, quote, the dance is empty of meaning, and this emptiness, too, is addictive. What might look like self-expression is actually a way of practicing absenting ourselves. A lively thought, which I think is extremely accurate, applies to lyric too, where it can subsist as itself, rather than as a swollen emanation of a poet figure which would block it in that capacity. This long history of antagonistic parent, pairings the naive, sentimental, the poetry, eloquence couples are pertinent because they're considerations of self-consciousness and if and where this may work against the poem. A modern acclaim of poets as heroes competing with each other for prizes sidesteps any critical thinking about the nature of self-presence for better or worse in their poems. Instead, it merely exalts their allotted personae. But there's at least a third pair to add, the impersonal slash personal. This familiar version of leaving yourself out has long been <coughs> looming and that is T.S. Eliot's embrace of impersonality. Also chiming to a degree with Mill's sentiments, Eliot writes, the progress of an artist is a continual self-sacrifice, a continual extinction of personality, end of quote. Yet, that often cited statement isn't, I think, a fair summary of Eliot's far more nuanced positions. He elaborates, quote, 
To divert interest from the poet to the poetry is a laudable aim, for it would conduce to a juster estimation of actual poetry, good and bad. But very few know when there is expression of significant emotion, emotion which has its life in the poem and not in the history of the poet. And Eliot goes straight on to declare, the emotion of art is impersonal and the poet cannot reach this impersonality without surrendering himself wholly to the work to be done. And he's not likely to know what is to be done unless he lives in what is not merely the present, but the present moment of the past, unless he is conscious not of what is dead, but of what is already living. So, it does seem clear enough that the emotion of art is impersonal, quote-unquote, in that there is a historically inflected, alert emotionality in <coughs> the poem's language. And that is something different from a transcription of the writer's own biography of feeling. And so, although Eliot first presents his impersonality by insisting on the non-biographical, his emphasis concludes on a positive poetic impersonality of emotion. It's not, as he's often taken to be saying, and that's understandable, for his formulations do lurch around a bit. It's not that poetry's subject matter ought to be impersonal, rather that there's a distinct impersonality which is living inside the poem itself. But I wonder whether the term transpersonal, to convey a poetic emotional language which is coursing through and across its readers, might better catch Eliot's drift here. And such a transpersonal mode is marked by temporal change and so can unwillingly grow archaic. Hence the worry about becoming unreadable because your natural reach of references and tone is no longer recognisable or even vaguely familiar to most of your readers. And that's the burden of David Jones' 1953 essay past and present, in which he broods over cultural and historical amnesia. If the poems of others that forcibly haunt your own head resonate with speech and images from even earlier ages, yet can't keep vivid what's almost lost, then layers of connotations turn threadbare. David Jones realises the embarrassment of becoming first atavistic and then indecipherable. And it is thought that the more ancient among us who've been writing for some decades, I think, are also prey to. Jones says, it may be that the kind of thing I have been trying to make is no longer makeable in the kind of way in which I have tried to make it. Language's dense associations become a hollowed shell. Human sensibilities crumble as everyone's range of feeling shrinks. So I've sketched a few understandings of, quote, impersonal and, quote, poetic writing, which are weighted towards the emotionality of the work itself in its historical power and its present vulnerability and its future frailty. What though is the connection between impersonality in the lyric and impersonality in its author? And would it be re unrealistic to imagine that some writers might elect for near anonymity? Yet I think it's too often assumed that every writer even if they protest otherwise, must really want recognition above all. 
The trouble is that this word recognition is now thoroughly compromised. It's tightly enlaced with a vision of public acclaim sealed by critical approval. That's though, I would suggest, brings it in fact closer to misrecognition, since the only real recognition that can count for the writer is her own knowledge of what she has, or according to her own lights, has not managed to do. And here, we might take a slight, we might be drawn with an only, only a slight swerve to a well-known 20th century advocacy of anonymity. And that is Michel Foucault's glorious assertion. What do you imagine that I would take so much trouble and so much pleasure in writing? Do you think I would keep so persistently to my task if I were not preparing, with a rather shaky hand, a labyrinth into which I can venture, in which I can move my discourse, opening up underground passages, forcing it to go far from itself, finding overhangs that reduce and deform its itinerary, in which I can lose myself and appear at last to eyes that I will never have to meet again. I am not, no doubt, the only one who writes in order to have no face. Do not ask who I am, and do not ask me to remain the same. Leave it to our bureaucrats and our police to see that our papers are in order. At least spare us their mortality when we write. Behind Foucault's stirring wish to have no face, actually, there's no will to self-erasure. Rather, his claim is for something different, an expansive anonymity in his off piste voyages through fresh intellectual territory. And that drive, as he understands it, accords with not needing to brandish a certificate of discipline, disciplinary credentials in order to be allowed to grub around in the archives. Lyric poetry also entails an absence of face. Not, I want to keep insisting, out of some private authorial shame or even perverse vanity alone, but as a necessary wandering which can't and shouldn't restrain itself. In his magnificent essay, The Thought of the Outside, Foucault describes a, quote, continuous streaming of language in which the human subject becomes, quote, a grammatical fold. He muses on the incalculable beyond of language where, quote, the naked experience of the I speak opens out as if undoing the relative containment of the I think. It's faintly reminiscent of Stéphane Malarmé in 1895, who writes, the pure work implies the disappearance of a poet as speaker, which yields the initiative to words set in motion by the clash of their inequality. And of course, such a primacy of words isn't at all the same as the author's rhetorical death, although that's a better known fate. There is something alluring about this vanishing of the author, yet a root other than excision is, I think, more persuasively pragmatic still. That involves viewing the poet, if still in a somewhat depersonalized way or transpersonalized way, as hovering on a threshold between the listening ear and what's received. There is an inherent anonymity to poetry, and that, I think, is in the nature of the beast. 
But there needn't be anything thin about this anonymity, which, if concealing a single author, can be a myriad chorus on the democratic air. And the notion of impersonality needn't imply the craggly harsh, the withholding, or the impoverished. And so Simone Weil constructs a desirable impersonality of her own, that is, not as detachment, but as its opposite, a recognition of others' humanity beyond false markers. She says, Gregorian chant, Romanesque architecture, the Iliad, the inversion of geometry were not occasions for the manifestations of personality. When science, art, literature, and philosophy are simply the manifestation of personality, they're on a level where glorious and dazzling achievements are possible, which can make a man's name live for thousands of years. But above this level, far above, separated by an abyss, is the level where the highest things are achieved. These things are essentially anonymous. A writer of a later and a violently different life, which is where I make a violently different temporal leap, Jack Spicer, also reflects this is in 1965, about what he too calls the outside of the poet. And Spicer says that essentially you are something which is being transmitted into, like a well-tuned radio, he says. You must cut out the crackling interruptions of redundant frequencies perhaps oddly reminiscent of J.S. Mill, Spicer's thought holds that, quote, the poem comes distorted through the things which are in you. So you must, he says, keep as much, as much of yourself as possible out of the poem to give way, not to a glacially pure quiet, but to a common voicing which careens in great loops across time. He says... Instead of being a private artifact, the dictated poem is a shared place. As collaborators, the poet and the poem's ghost texts create a community to inhabit their own posthumous future. And in this way, the poem remains commerce between the living and the dead, even after the death of the author. Or as Gilles Deleuze put it so succinctly, quote, for we are so sure of living again without resurrection only because so many beings and things think in us. End of quote. Such remarks evoke a poet brought into being in the acts of a listening writing. But that poet isn't identical with the biographical author. How can this authorial dwindling be positively figured? Praises of nakedness, often allied to fearless, fearlessness, often dance around the stripped-down poem. So Schiller had commented that among his ideal naive poets, their clarity is such that, quote, the language, so to speak, leaves the thought which it, which it expresses naked, since the other can never represent it without simultaneously veiling it. To invoke Spicer again, his exemplars of unveiled, pared-back lucidity with a border balance, crucial simplicity, as he calls it, and the anonymity of folk music. He adds that sometimes for great poetry, an infinitely small vocabulary is what you want. Perhaps that would be ideal, except for the fact that it's pretty hard to write a poem that way, end of quote. Though the harder part here might in turn on restricting your vocabulary, but 
holding your nerve in your pursuit of directness, as the ever succinct Friedrich Schlegel put it, quote, there is doubtless more difficulty in stating something than in explaining it. And I'm so fond of that remark that I'm going to repeat it. Schlegel says, there is doubtless more difficulty in stating something than in explaining it. Clothing lyric nakedness in Dalianfeld cogitation would stifle it. Not quite a century after Mill, Eliot laments the damage done, quote, in the acquisition of impersonal ideas which obscure what we really are and feel, what we really want, and what really excites our interest. It is, of course, not the actual information required, but the conformity which the accumulation of knowledge is apt to impose that's harmful. Tennyson is a very fair example of a poet almost wholly encrusted with parasitic opinion, almost wholly merged into his environment. Blake, on the other hand, knew what interested him, and he therefore presents only the essential, only, in fact, what can be presented and need not be explained. And because he was not distracted or frightened or occupied in anything but exact statement, he understood. He was naked and saw man naked and from the centre of his own crystal. To him, there was no reason why Swedenborg should be absurd than Locke. He accepted Swedenborg and eventually rejected him for reasons of his own. He approached everything with a mind unclouded by current opinions. There was nothing of the superior person about him. This makes him terrifying. <laughs> End of quote. And I'm very fond of that passage because um, it completely undoes that rather thin notion of Eliot, the, the preacher of impersonality to cool. Directness, of course, entails setting aside authorial knowingness and a helpful description of how this comes about was offered by the American poet, the American lyric poet, Fanny Howe, when she was interviewed a few years ago in 2016, asked what she'd meant by previously stating that she, quote, let the words write the poems, she replied, we each have our rhythm of attention, of how far we can go on our own brain power. Then something else takes over. The words, the sound, the materials themselves. The struggle that the writer creates for herself is to make a place where she can get lost without fear. That last remark is one to be lingered over. Making a place where you can get lost without fear is so memorable and enticing a phrase because it's so sharply accurate about what I hazard must be the experience of writing for many of us. The lyrics qualities of being open and uncalculating needs its writer's willingness to stay uncertain, to not be knowing, to tolerate being unsure of where the work might lead you, needs a confident kind of abandon, a consent to not see where you are going, or rather and more interestingly, where it is going. Fanny Howe's interviewer goes on to ask her, what are the great poems of the impersonal? And she answers, the Psalms, very early poetry, from Celtic to Chinese, Syriac to Greek. My dream poem is to capture what they do, 
that incredible impersonal emotion, but there's no one there. And her phrase, there's no one there, strikes me is exactly right. In fact, there's little doubt that Schiller would have gladly have placed Fanny Howe's examples and her own work, indeed, if he could have done, as at home among his naive poetries. Those examples are drawn from antiquity for lyric writing, entails listening scrupulously to the dead as well as to the living, which accounts for why your writing feels, as Peter Gizzi has often and usefully repeated, always posthumous. And that remark directly echoes Jack Spicer, who asserts that, quote, the poet is always posthumous in the act of composition, especially given that the life of the poem may well outspan its writer's life. And the poem itself, a chamber of the calling voices of the dead, as Peter Gizzi elaborates, I am working in a language that's haunted. It's bigger than me. It's older than me. It doesn't live in me. I live in it. We all do. And it's a haunted prospect to sing in something that is long gone while it is becoming. End of quote. And he goes on to describe his own understanding of lyric. I would call it the impersonal personal. I am interested in what I would like to call the borderless nature of selfhood and tradition. End of quote. Peter Gizzi's is a more elegant description of what I've been trying to characterise as apersonal or transpersonal. It better captures that lively, many-voiced and always historical kind of anonymity which reverberates through lyric. We could also conceive of a warm impersonality or a generous impersonality. For it is the impacted coincidence of the absolute impersonality of language with that absolute intimacy embodied in inner voice that I'm constantly forced back to. If the language of the outside falls on interior terrain as each person's language of the inside, that interiority is also layered by once external words, by the rustling of the past present. Neither fully impersonal nor exactly personal, the writing creature must live on that lively threshold. A final note, though. Has a false dichotomy sneaked into my suggestions here? If, as I was talking about a couple of days ago, if stumbling upon a fresh idea needs another person's presence, even if a silent presence, how come that the poem needs its unregarded, unself-regarding solitude to break through? And my tentative answer to my own question is, because lyric poetry isn't only formed through the voices of others, but it is always self-overhearing, and or but itself are legion, itself are also many. Lyric poetry is, so to speak, 
a chorus of ears. So thank you.